Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Terry Harvey, Vice President of Cultural Programs at the Meridian Center for Cultural Diplomacy, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization based in Washington, D.C., that strengthens engagement between the United States and the world through diplomacy, leadership, and culture. Our goal is to employ the arts as a means to address issues that matter to us most. And we accomplish this through customized leadership exchanges, exhibition development, and cultural programs in the U.S. and abroad. I encourage all of you to visit Meridian's website to explore ways to get involved in this important work. You can find us at www.meridian.org. I'm pleased to welcome you to our program, Do Museums Matter? Moderated by Ms. Heidi Zuckerman, member of Meridian's Cultural Diplomacy Leadership Council. Heidi is the founder of HIZ.art, a multi-platform project that connects all to art. She is the host of the podcast, Conversations About Art, for which she invites artists, curators, collectors, and more to explore art through threads of uncertainty, happiness, and spirituality with new episodes available every Tuesday on Apple and Spotify. Heidi is the former CEO and director of the Aspen Art Museum where she served for 14 years. She has curated more than 100 exhibitions during her career and is the author of numerous books including Conversations with Artists Volumes 1 and 2 and a widely loved children's book, The Rainbow Hour with, with artist Amy Adler. Our goal for this program is to address the important role museums play in our community, as well as the impact the COVID-19 crisis has had on museums and the efforts to, made to mitigate short-term and long-term implications to the global museum experience. Without further delay, please welcome Ms. Heidi Zuckerman to the program. Heidi? TK, thank you so much. It's an honor to serve on the Advisory Council for the Meridian Center for cultural diplomacy. And I think in this time, cultural diplomacy is probably never been more needed. So thanks for inviting me to moderate this panel today. And I'm now going to introduce the panelists, all of whom I am so grateful took the time to be with us today from a variety of places. I'll start with Kaywin Feldwin. Kaywin currently serves as the director of the National Gallery of Art since December, 2018. Previously, she led the Minneapolis Institute of Art since 2008 at its, as its Nevin and Duncan McMillan director and president. In that time, she transformed the museum's relationship to the city by opening its doors to community dialogue, providing free membership and engaging with the defining social issues of our time. Her many accomplishments include the creation of a center for empathy and visual arts at the museum. She's the past president of the Association of Art Museum Directors and past chair of the American Alliance of Museums and a frequent speaker on reinventing the museum for the 21st century. She's a champion of digital technology for expanding access to art. We also have with us today, Franklin Sermons, who has been the director of the Perez Art Museum in Miami since the fall of 2015. Since coming to PAM, he has overseen the acquisition of more than a thousand works of art by donation or purchase. At PAM, he has pursued his vision of PAM as, quote, the People's Museum, representing a Miami lens by strengthening existing affiliate groups such as the PAM Fund for African American Art and creating the International Women's Committee and the Latin American and Latinx Art Fund. Prior to his appointment, he was the department head and curator of contemporary art at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art from 2010 to 2015. We also are joined by Chong Sak Ching, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the National Gallery of Singapore and the head of the Visual Arts Cluster, Singapore, since April 2013. The VAC comprises the Singapore Art Museum, the Singapore Tyler Print Institute, and the National Gallery of Singapore. Prior to this, she was President and CEO of Ascendias from 2001 and was recognized as Outstanding CEO of the Year in Singapore Business Awards 2018. 09 for her leadership and dynamism in establishing Ascendia as Asian's leading provider of business space. She's also a director on the board of Mandai Park Holdings. And this is probably my favorite thing. She is currently Singapore's non-resident ambassador to the Republic of Chile. So thanks so much for being here today. I wanted to start off, I, I know that we, we're all pretty clear on what the challenges are. Uh, we have COVID, we have incredible social unrest, we have uh, just the opportunity to 
think about um, how we exist in a time where everything we used to do uh, is being reconsidered. Um, and I, I was thinking about how long the museums, at least in the US, have been closed and how quickly they closed. And I was thinking about the night at the museum and the movie and what happens when no one's there. And so I wanted to kind of start off with a, a general sort of acknowledgement of all the challenges that are happening and start to ask you all about where you think the opportunities are. And I wanted to start with you, Kaywin, because you're in your office and I know that you've gone to your office every day. And so you're in the museum, no one else is there, but all the artworks are still there. It's, it's like there was a moment in time that was stuck. So what is it like being in the museum with no one there? Um, different, of course, than when you're there on a day when the museum is just closed. Uh, but what does it feel like to be in the museum? Acknowledging all the current challenges, where are the opportunities? We'll start with Kaywin and then we'll move through each of the panelists. Thank you, Heidi. Um, I actually have this um, funny calendar that um, Carter Brown, um, my predecessor of, uh, gosh, when did Carter retire? Around 1990, I think. Um, and um, Carter uh, worked with I.M. Pei in designing the East Building of the National Gallery. And he has this funny calendar with cubes. It's very 1970s that you move around. And um, I've deliberately left it on March the 13th, which was the last day that the National Gallery staff were all in here together. And I'm going to leave it there until um, we're all back again. Um, it, it, uh, the gallery is always a special place, whether we are open or closed. Obviously, it comes to life with visitors and people. Uh, but I have always felt that it's a it's a spiritual experience walking through the East Building atrium. Um, I, I've always arrived early in the morning, and so even when we were open to the public, I'd have this sort of quiet moment with um, by myself in this volume of space with the um, key works of sculpture that um, um, I am Pei and, and Carter and others worked to place, um, and so it still has this kind of temple feeling um, for me. And um, you know, we've we've like all museums, I think, had a basic core of staff that's come in in different shifts throughout being closed. So our security team and um, facilities and. Uh, one of my delights in coming here was learning that the National Gallery has a huge um, staff of horticulturalists because, you know, we were designed with these wonderful garden courts. And so uh, we have to keep the plants alive. So our horticulturalists are coming both for the plants inside the building, but also our sculpture garden and outside. So, you know, some of the um, sort of day-to-day -day work has continued. And then um, uh, I'll also note that um, we've been in a process of uh, renovating the East Building for a long time. And um, our last phase, I hope, is um, we're replacing all the skylights in the East Building, which involves building a platform um, underneath the skylights. And so for only the third time in our history, we took that giant Calder mobile down. It's the largest mobile that, that Calder ever made um, from the East Building. And it was amazing to watch our team came in they were able to practice social distancing. They all had their masks on. And um, it was like walking, watching an orchestra as everybody knew their roles. And we brought the Calder down and, and took it apart. So, you know, some of those things um, still happening. And, um, and uh, you know, I hope that we, we've already reopened our sculpture garden to the public. And we're hoping to reopen the ground floor of the West Building on July 20th. So we're all getting excited about bringing the public back. The last thing I'll say is that I think one of the challenges has been to keep everybody connected to our mission during this time. And we have about 1,200 employees, you know, all or almost all working from home. And so trying to figure out how to um, through constant messages from me and um, work with um, so many of our expert um, content team to keep everybody close to the mission. 
Okay, great. We'll circle back to that. Thank you for setting the tone with that and particularly referencing the idea of the museum as a, as a sacred place. And it's not just a building with four walls and a ceiling. It's, it's a place to um, connect people with, with objects, which is one of the things that I think we'll circle back to. So Franklin, you made a very early and um, now clearly prescient decision to close your institution and, and to project when you would reopen. So talk with us about those challenges, obviously, uh, and, and where you found some opportunity. Sure, Heidi, thank you. And so good to be here with you all. Happy to represent the non-national uh, museum in this space this morning. Um, you know, in, in hindsight, and you see it here, I think we've all been taking advantage of our global opportunities, you know, to be in conversation from New York, Aspen, DC, Singapore, in the moment, and we have these relationships. But one thing that baffles me, I have to say, and, and we're constantly looking for silver linings. So in February, mid-February, we held one of our biggest fundraisers of the year. And there was not an inkling in the air about what was to come. Everybody was partying outside. We had a great time. There was no social distance at all whatsoever. On March 7, we had our largest annual fundraiser, our annual gala. And it was a Saturday evening, steamy Saturday evening in Miami. And people were a little bit more distant. I noticed that some of our older visitors were a little bit more cautious in terms of their intimacy, had hand cleanser at our tables. So it was a very different feeling. Five days later, of course, we're all on urgent conversations amongst colleagues here in Miami. What are we going to do? Some of us were closing within 24 hours, and I'd say that that started to happen on Wednesday, the 11th of March. On Friday, the 13th, we decided that we wanted to stay open through the weekend. Miami is very much a town driven by tourism. We've, we've really prided ourselves in the past on being a community-centered place, a place where people can come not only for dialogue, conversation, spurred on by artwork, but an actual meaningful place in, in a community-based role. So for instance, in the past, we deal with hurricanes a lot here in Miami. We've been a drop-off point for relief supplies for people to come and leave things to send to other places. Most recently, we did that last year with the Bahamas, where we were bringing together supplies to send there. And so we have thrived, I think, off of the position of being not just a place to come and have an experience with art, but a place that actually has some role to play in a civic conversation that has to do with society. And so we decided to stay open through the weekend. We probably had about four or 500 people, maybe about 10% of what would be normal on, on a weekend like that, especially a spring weekend. And and I think it was meaningful for some people. I, I, I know it was for certain tourists that were here in town that all of a sudden found out that, you know, hotels weren't providing the kind of service that they thought they were getting and attractions weren't doing everything that they were looking forward to. So it was nice to be able to do that. But then we closed on March 16th, that Monday. And, um, you know, it, it was a amazing pivot, I think, for all of us. You know, we talk about Zoom now as if we've been talking about it for the last 20 years. I had never <laughs> been on a Zoom call <laughs> until March 16. That was my first Zoom call. And I was on Monday morning with 100 staff members. And somehow we did it. And we've managed to move forward from that point. So I, I, I offer that as, as a jumping off point. But I was at that moment that we knew we were dealing with something that was going to be a level of uncertainty that we could not possibly fathom. So we didn't come to a decision immediately, but we looked at three, four scenarios, anything from three months to 24 months, and um, came up with a way for us to get through the year. And I would have to say that 
for our for our fiscal year, we had just begun in January. So our fiscal year is a calendar year, um, and it meant that we were projecting for the next nine or eight or nine months. And that also led to the kind of financial wherewithal to look at it um, through that lens. So we made a target date of September 1. Um, right now, we continue to use that as our target, and I am incredibly hopeful. The last couple of weeks have been a little bit more difficult. Um, we do have a sculpture garden, and of course, we are in a climate that allows for us to be outside year-round. So we did plan to have our sculpture garden uh, open before that point, and we still continue to, to look forward to being able to bring people back in that fashion. Outside could be the new indoors in a way. So I'm, I'm hopeful from that point of view, but we're still looking forward to the fall. Okay, great. So, John, tell us what your institution is currently experiencing and how, how the challenges and opportunities of your institution are, are being addressed under your leadership. Yeah, thank you, Heidi, and thanks again for this opportunity to be uh, here in conversation with you all. Um, well, I would say that uh, we, we must have been pretty lucky, I mean, hearing from, you know, both uh, Kevin and, and Franklin that uh, we already reopened uh, for two weeks now, and we were closed for less than three months. And even before we closed completely, uh, we were already starting to scale down our operations in terms of reducing uh, the number of people into the gallery, uh, putting in place safe distancing measures, so we were kind of uh, slowly tightening before we closed. And then now when we reopen, we were kind of going back to where we were before we closed. So we, we were, you could say that slowly easing in and easing out uh, of um, the, the closure and the reopening. And I, I guess that's, you know, uh, kind of in a way, uh, typical of the Singapore very organized uh, and structured way of thinking ahead. Uh, and we were already having uh, crisis management meetings before uh, the lockdown came in, before the closure or what in Singapore we call the circuit breaker uh, kicked in. Um, so we were planning what we would have to do, should we have to close, and every week after we closed, we were having also crisis management meetings with the ministry, with other museums to start to plan for reopening. So when we were allowed to reopen, uh, it, I would say it was pretty smooth. Um, and uh, the happiest people when we reopened were our front of house. They were our gallery hosts. They missed the, the painting, the artworks. They missed the visitors and you could see them behind, underneath their mask, the smiles in their faces. You could see the smiles in their eyes. And, and that is so heartwarming because you could see how much it means to them to be uh, working in a museum and to be able to be with the art. Uh, so this is our second week. Uh, when we reopened, visitors were still very cautious. So the numbers that came through were not a lot. But in the second weekend, it doubled the numbers that came in the first weekend. So that was very uh, reassuring. Um, and uh, we are now um, hoping that more will uh, feel that it is safe to come by. Um, and yeah, we are, we are ready you know, to, to, um, to welcome all of them back. So I was actually in the Aspen Art Museum on Saturday and you were supposed to make an appointment, and but I, you know, hadn't done that. But I sort of timidly, you know, looked in the door, and they're like, "Come in, come in, come in." So, and I have to say, it was really great being in the galleries and seeing the frontline staff. And of course, everyone wants to hug you, but no one can. Uh, but you know, honestly, I brought my daughter, and we looked at at art together, and just that experience of standing in front of an object with someone that I love um, and having that conversation. You know, it, Franklin, you were talking about how you hadn't been on a Zoom call until March 16th and, you know, this idea of like the new normal, right? I mean, I don't, I don't think I'll ever 
um, think that every anything is normal again, but I know that I will always, you know, probably appreciate every day differently, maybe than I than I did before. But we titled this panel "Do Museums Matter?" and of course, the, the punchline is, you know, yes. we all think so. Um, but we're a biased um, crowd. <laughs> <laughs> we're a biased crowd, you know. But but not everyone thinks so. And it's not that they think that museums don't matter or that museums shouldn't exist, though some people do think that. But I think, you know, the idea of the title of this panel is, is to use it kind of as a rallying cry and to say, like, if we didn't have these opportunities to look at art together, to stand in front of objects, to be moved by these things that we know that are sacred, you know, how, what would the world look like? So I, I'd like you each to to just sort of respond to that and kind of give your your feeling about that whether it's you know based on your own experience of um, growing up going to art or how you talk about art and museums to people who've never been in them before you know what's what's your kind of best pitch on why on why they do matter who do you well, want whoever wants to go first <laughs> Let me start. Um, Thank you. Because uh, I, I want to share something very interesting. Um, we, there was a survey conducted in Singapore recently uh, in this current crisis. And the question that was asked uh, of the public in this survey is, which jobs do you believe are essential and which are not? So, uh, and of course, you know that during this period, if you are not in an essential service, you're not allowed to go to work, right? You, or you work from home or not at all. Um, so the survey came back and not unexpectedly, uh, doctors and nurses were rated the number one essential worker. Whilst the top ranked non-essential worker is the artist. So... Obviously, that created a, a huge uproar among the arts community. And then the debate ensued in terms of what, therefore, is the value of art, you know? Does the artist not matter? You know, does art not matter? And, um, and I, I suppose, especially when you're faced with uh, this existential kind of health crisis that's leading to job losses, to financial stresses, if, you know, where does art stand in this whole scheme of, of things? And if art doesn't matter, then do art museums matter? So is it a question of the fact that maybe we've taken art for granted? Because I'm quite sure that during this lockdown, many of us are listening to music. We are, you know, watching movies on Netflix. Um, and uh, we need all these to, to feed our soul, you know, if not intellectually and, you know, uh, also for our mental health. And I, I think, Heidi, you're the great, yeah, you're the right person to talk about the value of art. But it seems that, you know, not everybody thinks that way. So I, I, I thought, I was just wondering, what, what kind of a response do you think a similar survey, uh, if conducted in the U.S., would you? What, where would the artist kind of rank in this whole uh, scheme of things? I'll, I'll jump in with that. There's actually an old survey. Um, uh, so it, it's at least um, 10 years out of date, but um, I remember being struck that um, in this American survey, people ranked the value of art quite high, but artists quite low. So that disconnect between who actually makes the art, um, just to answer that question. But um, uh, I would add that, um, you know, I, I love what I do because um, I really like art and I really like people. And art museums, of course, are a place where both come together. And I've um, spent a lot of my last year reading about the history of the National Gallery. And I've always been struck by um, something that Paul Mellon said when um, we opened our doors in 1941 and it was the big opening moment. Um, and I'm sorry, actually, this particular was said by um, President um, Roosevelt. And he said that he was dedicating the gallery to the American people so that we could ensure that the um, human spirit would live on. 
and um, and it was 1941, so we spoke it during World War II. And I like to think that um, the gallery is sort of founding with this idea of um, the human spirit, our shared humanity, um, is part of what runs through. And um, I, I'm sure we'd all agree that one of the things we've seen through this um, period is, just as Chung just said, um, people have flocked to the arts, um, even though it's been virtual. And, um, and of course, I do believe it's because of this um, value of, of a shared humanity. And um, I, I know, as, as you know, Heidi, I've uh, done a lot of research and work in the areas of both wonder and empathy in the role of art museums there. And um, I, I've always been struck that social scientists have shown that when um, we feel the experience of wonder, whether it's the Grand Canyon, a speech by Dr. King, or a work of art in a, in a museum, that um, we actually become, as human beings, we become less narcissistic. We're less worried about our schedules and obligations because we actually have this moment of feeling part of something bigger than ourselves. So part of a shared humanity and we're more likely to be generous and to volunteer because we're more connected with people. And I think that's the value that we've seen continue on through the shutdown period. And I think it's um, going to further explode when we all reopen. Yeah, sure, it's not a, not a whole lot more to add to, to that aspect. I think the idea of shared humanity and the fact that we all are here and love art is it's not only because of the appreciation but for what it does in terms of bringing us all together from anywhere and everywhere um i mean i had the the good fortune of working at the manila collection in houston and you know founded by um uh john and dominique de manil uh, founded from an ethos of humanity and of shared humanity of the celebration of universal ideas and art always being in the service of something. Um, you know, they are known for having uh, Barnett Newman's um, Broken Obelisk uh, placed in Houston in memory of Martin Luther King, um, given to the city, actually, uh, attempted to be given to the city, which they refer the Rothko Chapel, you know, this idea that the human spirit is always attached to any ideal uh, humanism and on universal shared values. So I think that we all, like, we all come from that place and believe so deeply in that. Um, and I think that's important for us as a museum that was only founded in, in 1984. Um, we were founded in a moment of time, not unlike the present in some ways. Uh, we were dealing with a lot of xenophobia, a lot of immigration in the wake of uh, Mariel Boatlift, in the wake of another uh, police killing, uh, that of Arthur McDuffie in 1979, and the acquittal of police officers in 1980 the ensuing kind of um, unrest uh, and unease of many different people not quite understanding each other and trying to figure out a way to live together. In a city that of course prides itself now on the fact that if you go to our city hall, you're looking at most of the information in three different languages. And I don't think we can say that about everywhere uh, in this country. You're looking at it in Creole, Spanish, and English. And so we tried to move forward from that point. And I would just add within the context of the moment, you know, one of the things that I think has been helpful for us is we showed, not unlike many other museums, a work um, by Arthur Jaffa. And it is a piece um, that deals, a video installation piece that deals with a kind of history of black people in America, uh, all put together in a seven minute span, fast moving clips that are made from archival images and the most recent images culled from the news and is obviously quite topical for, for today. Um, we showed that piece, but we showed it in a program called Art Detectives. 
And that was a program that actually brought uh, community youth into the museum to actually look at and discuss artworks with our Miami-Dade County police. And I would say that, you know, in hindsight, um, th that the power of art being the bridge to dialogue between people who see things differently, and it's okay to see things differently, but let's talk about why one's given experience allows me to see this in a completely different way than you do, um, helps us understand each other, helps us bridge gaps that, that, that hopefully represent the opportunity of this moment that we sit on right now with this dueling crisis. We already had COVID to show us the depth and degree of inequity, uh, the, the, the way that healthcare is not spread equally uh, across lines in this country. Um, how do we learn from that? How do we take advantage of this moment while we're talking about that? And, and I think this piece has also uh, provoked great conversations on the other crisis that we're dealing with um, in this, not only in this country, but around the world in terms of Black Lives Matter. So we're trying to, to jump off from that point. Find value. Thank you. So, Franklin, your feed, I think, is maybe coming um, in and out a little bit. But, um, but the um, Arthur Jaffa work that you reference is incredibly powerful, and I, I've seen it multiple times, and I did see it in Miami in your institution as well. And um, the opportunity that you are referencing to have art be in the service of something larger. Um, you know, we've referenced the idea of art in service of spirituality uh, and kind of connectivity and art in service of empathy and humanity and, and, uh, and those are obviously all essential things. And the idea of art in service of not only building community, but instructing people, frankly, on how to see. Um, yeah. And because if people can't see other people, um, then, you know, there is a total absence of, of humanity. Um, yes. And the programs that can be put in place to educate whether they're, you know, children or adults um, on, on how to actually look at things, um, these things that somehow, you know, we take for granted that everyone can see, but there's actually an art to seeing, <laughs> you know, um, as well as an, an art to looking. Mm -hmm. So, how are you guys finding your communities responding to being online? I mean, we talked about the benefit of, you know, being in these super disparate geographic places. And you guys all said yes to this right away because it's basically just finding time on your calendar instead of having to get on a plane and, you know, be away from your families or, you know, uh, taking a lot of time to do something for an hour. And now this is just an hour. Right, so that whole and yes, change because of you asked times. <laughs> exactly, Jay Wayne. We would have done it. We would have flown to Australia for you. <laughs> well, and you guys have flown places for me before, and so yeah. I'm super grateful for that. Um, not minimizing, not minimizing your efforts or your yes in any way, um, but sort of referencing this is the good part, you know, of technology is being able to be together when we're, we can't be together. Um, but but I I know we all share the belief that you know works of art have energy and um, if I feel like if you've seen something before you can see it digitally or through technology but maybe if you've never been in front of it before I'm not sure so I, I'm wondering how your how your communities are responding to to what you're showing um, in a digital space and and what's what's worked well. I'll, I'll go first. Um, uh, a lot of the sort of work in the digital space is quite new to the gallery. And um, I am so proud of our team that they, they basically had a, a day and a half notice that we were closing. And I kept passing curators on the moving walkway uh, over to the West Building to film video content so that we would have um, content um, to push mm -hmm. out there. So I'm super proud of our team for just pivoting and, and going forward with it. And I think um, all of us, uh, really all museums have been um, 
uh, somewhat surprised and thrilled to see the response we've had in the uh, digital programming that we've all done. So I think that's been terrific. It'll be interesting to see what happens, you know, a year after there's a vaccine and how much what that balance is of um, virtual. Uh, but I have never ever worried that uh, digital would replace the in-person experience of going to an art museum. I, I, like you, Heidi, you know, believe in that sort of aura of the original work. And I think people, even um, people who don't necessarily um, visit art museums often, I think also they get that aura. I mean, we all hear that question all the time of, is that original? Is that the real thing? <laughs> and as we have the ability to fake more and more in our culture, I think that the real thing will only have greater importance. But I think the big lesson for all of us during COVID is um, to see that the digital world offers us some really expansive opportunities that we hadn't been taken advantage of before. Because I think um, museums often sort of at first started websites because we knew we had to and it helped people find our locations. And then, you know, we might put a bit of information um, so that people could prepare for their visit. But I think what we've seen is that um, going forward, our websites are going to be much more robust in our digital work. And it will be a sort of that both will exist together. And it's not that the digital replaces the in-person, but there are things you can do digitally you can't do in person and vice versa. And so I think we're going to see greater recognition of the opportunity of both. Yeah, uh, both and maybe instead of either or. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I couldn't agree more uh, with uh, Kevin. In fact, uh, I, I think many of us can relate to this uh, statement that the, the key driver of digital transformation in our organization is not the CEO, it's not the CTO, it's COVID-19. And, and it really you know, bears out for us too because what we've been planning to do uh, for the digital uh, space in the last five years, I think we got it done in like two to three months. Um, and and the, the, the kind of innovation that has gone into creating the digital offerings, I think is just amazing. So in that very short two months or so, we converted what was to be a physical festival for children uh, into an online, 100% online festival uh, for the kids. Um, and we are also lucky in Singapore that the, the connectivity is quite good and most of the kids, not everyone, would have access to you know, a, a laptop. Mm -hmm. And they were also home-based, home uh, doing home-based uh, learning, homeschooling. So the ability to engage uh, with them uh, was very, very good, uh, very strong. And uh, we've got very good feedback so far. And we expanded the repertoire of offerings into um, with podcasts, with virtual tours, um, and also combining, you know, um, meditation, art therapy, uh, and uh, having music, you know, with art. So all of these just uh, allowed us to engage with various segments of uh, audiences. So, so one positive that came out with um, this digitalization of uh, or expansion of our uh, offering into the digital realm is that we were able to reach new audiences uh, which we were not able to do so before and we hope that they get converted and as Kevin had said um, be uh, intrigued enough after the engagement online to then come to the physical museum um, when we open and our frame of thinking and planning right now is that we have to start uh, planning for two museums, a physical and a digital, a virtual, right? And uh, it might reach uh, the same audiences, but it's very likely that it could also be reaching different audiences. And therefore, the way you would present a work or an exhibition online versus the physical uh, could be different. In fact, I think it has to be different. So that when the, when the visitor comes to the museum, the physical museum, he would be experiencing something different uh, though it might be the same content. So I think that's the excitement about, you know, uh, and, and the wonderful opportunity that if you say COVID, you know, has presented as. Uh. Yeah, I have to agree with John. 
um, it was like probably so many of the things we thought we would be doing in two to three years happened in two to three months. Um, we had really been putting a digital initiative into place and received funding from the Knight Foundation specifically for that a little over a year ago. Um, another one of those silver linings is that we hired a director of digital engagement. Um, I think she started in April 1, so a couple of weeks after the shutdown. And these kind of things just fed into each other to accelerate this process that we all know is part and parcel of our futures. How do we find a complementary ground between the physical space and the virtual space? I think it also has been interesting, as has been said, how we've discovered our audiences and how we know more about our audiences, how we know that we have an audience anywhere around the world. And, and that is just as important as, as this idea of attendance, which is such a, uh, a driver of the past on determining our value. So we're looking at that in different ways right now. We held our first um, virtual program, which would have been a, it's a program called Local Views, where we work with an artist from our community who goes through the museum and talks about works in the collection that have influenced them. And it's an awesome, intimate experience to walk around with an artist in that way on an evening at the museum. And you have maybe 20 people or so. And, and the second week we were closed, we did the same thing online and you have a hundred and some odd people who are all talking from different places. And it was just so invigorating in that sense. And, and I think a sense of the optimism that we all have within the digital sphere and that we know is going to play such an integral role in our futures together. So I, I want to just kind of step aside for a second to say that if people who are listening have questions that you can put them in the chat box uh, because I don't think we've said that. But I, I have long said that I think in order to be a museum director, CEO, leader, you have to be an eternal optimist. I think that's just probably the number one job uh, responsibility is to be optimistic and, and certainly I am feeling optimistic listening to all of you and, and being with you and communicating um, on these topics. What, what, what are you guys afraid of? Like sitting here today, um, looking back, looking forward, being present, you know, what are, what are some of your, what are some of your fears? You flipped on us there, Heidi. We all thought you were going to ask us what we were optimistic about. It's not fair. That's a great question. Hmm. Well, the uncertainty. Uh, just the uncertainty of, of this moment has been, um, I think it's the most difficult thing to navigate. Um, I believe we're all now doing some level of scenario planning, but how many scenarios are we looking at? Um, we just don't actually know between the day to day. Um, it's so good to be on here and talking about uh, the museum in Singapore being open and NK okay, when you're going to be opening in July. Um, looking forward to that and, and I know for all of us that physical experience is something that we're so here for. But I would say the most difficult thing within this moment is simply the level of uncertainty. We had, um, in order to maintain presence and to keep viable, uh, in addition to the digital presence, we actually opened a pop-up shop in a more commercial neighborhood here called the Design District, um, which is a couple of miles away from the museum. And, you know, it's, um, we all want to get back at it and get back into business and get things flowing economically. So we're in a, a luxury uh, retail area and we have a little pop-up shop, about 400 square feet, um, which is wonderful to have that presence. But then, of course, in the last couple of weeks here in Miami, we've seen that, you know, we have a start and then we have to back up a little bit. So that uncertainty is just uh, going to continue, I think, to... Uh, challenge us. Mm. Yeah. The I, health I, uncertainty, yeah. but also the financial uncertainty of just not knowing 
what's going to happen to all of us financially after this. So I, I would echo that. Mm, yeah. I, I think there's the uncertainty of whether having open, will we have to close again? Because every country that has kind of opened up is facing a second wave. Uh, and also adding on to Kevin's point about funding. Um, though I would say that uh, fortunately in Singapore, uh, we have pretty strong support from the government. Uh, so at least from what we're hearing now, the um, uh, funding of museums will continue. And uh, the, is, there's also additional budget that was allocated to see through this difficult period to support the arts group. But the other sources of funding, donations, uh, patronage. Uh, we do, we have six restaurants in the gallery. They, they are, I think they're struggling. All retail F&B is struggling. All our venue uh, hires, the rental of our venue spaces, it, when, when no one is allowed to gather in groups, you know, there'll be no events. So the sources of, uh, of uh, funding is, is really um, kind of narrowed and, and dried up in some cases. But uh, again, the, the good news is that uh, it's not that philanthropy is, is dead because, you know, in the first five months of this year during COVID, um, the amount of money that was donated equal was about 90 million in the case of Singapore, equal the, the amount that was donated for the whole of last year. So in five months, the same amount was given out uh, compared to 12 months of last year, but the bulk of it went to COVID related uh, causes. Uh, then the rest that are not COVID related, of course had uh, reduced uh, donation. So this is a, I think an area of concern because many businesses, their own balance sheet are very weak and, uh, and I, I think they themselves would be looking at uh, seeking financial support. Um, so this is also a time that I think for us, we have to look at how to support our previous uh, donors and supporters and not just be putting our hands out for, you know, to them at times like this. So this is where I think a strong stewardship um, is, is important. Kaywin, what are you afraid of? Uh, I actually have to agree um, with Franklin and Chong that it is this, the uncertainty of this moment that there's no playbook and um, it's the, the health uncertainty, the financial uncertainty. Um, and, uh, you know, as I sort of started, um, it's also, uh, really difficult to have the staff all working remotely and they have been so brave and, you know, uh, have, have made heroic efforts to do so. But I worry about uh, particular employees who live alone and those perhaps who have less communicative um, supervisors or in smaller departments, it's hard to make sure that everybody is doing okay. And um, that uh, it worries me. It really worries me. I was going to ask a question about that because you started off talking about the, the isolation, of course, of, of uh, the people that you're responsible for, right? And, and that's the idea of, of being a leader is about leading. And so what are you guys doing now to, to lead? Uh, what kind of examples are you providing for your teams? What are some things that you have tried that you think work particularly well? And as part of that question also, you know, how are you taking care of yourselves? You know, what kind of rituals have you put in place? Um, to make sure that that you can endure um, the uncertainty and because it's you know it's not a marathon right it's probably multiple hundred mile races you know back to back so mm -hmm. yeah almost an answer to the question of uncertainty has been the one guiding light I think for us has been communication and and it's something that you know, we talk about in, in, in broad ways as being challenging for the best companies in the best of times. But I would say that we were 
challenged prior to COVID in terms of communication throughout the ranks of the museum, from visitor services through senior staff to the relationship with the board. And it's something that we were aware of. And again, silver lining maybe, it's something I think we've had the opportunity to work much harder on out of necessity. Because of our own leadership uncertainty, we need the conversation. We have to thrive off of learning from each and every single individual we can. One way we've done that is just to make sure we keep these regular meetings. And I know at times it feels like a lot for, for a lot of us, but the regularity of the meetings and knowing that we're gonna have an all staff every Monday morning at 10 o'clock and we're all gonna see each other, at least for a second, is, is really important in maintaining some degree of cohesiveness amongst us all. We also started instituting a, a board guest at every one of these meetings to try and close the gap a little bit between staff and board and to, to, to you know, to foster this idea because we really are all in this together. So those are a couple of things that have been helpful. But again, silver linings in the midst of a challenge. Yeah, I, I, I can't agree more. I think communication is so important. Like, I've never had so many town halls <laughs> in my the last five years. And I think, you know, uh, the regular uh, platforms to speak with staff to answer their questions. And then that's supplemented by, you know, emails to staff to tell them about what's happening, what's coming up, uh, so that, you know, uh, they are not surprised. That, that is so important. We, we did a survey um, in the midst of, you know, working from home to ask uh, our colleagues if, uh, how they were coping and whether they felt that they could continue working from home even after we reopened. Um, and a, a vast majority, I, would, I think about between 70 to 80% said that they uh, are happy to continue working from home uh, and they have the necessary resources, etc. So now that we are open, the majority of our, of our colleagues are still working from home uh, and productivity has not dropped. In fact, many of them are saying they're working harder than ever because you, know, you zoom in and out of meetings without even having to walk out of the room. So that in itself then brings another level of concern, which is you know, physical and mental health. And what we are trying to do now is to also provide access, uh, resources for them should they need uh, any kind of support, whether it's peer support or it's even external specialist support. We want to make sure that that is uh, available. And on the longer term, if we continue to work from home, then what does it do to teamwork? What does it do to, you know, that collaborative spirit that we need, uh, that we need uh, and we build up through physical meetings? So we are now also thinking of how to um, ensure that we do not lose that, that team uh, spirit and, and bond. Uh, any ideas I think would be great, but, uh, you know, we, we, we are still, you know, looking at how we can maintain that. I'll just, um, I'll be brief to say that I, I sort of echo that communication and it's slicing and dicing in lots of ways, town halls. I do office hours twice a week for groups of uh, five or six uh, folks from across the, the gallery. Um, I do lots of writing and I've tried to keep three themes constantly in front of people and I emphasize them in all sorts of ways and I like alliteration. So um, one is connection. I just keep hammering that I want people to stay connected, colleagues, but family, friends. And the other is curiosity. And um, I often find myself thinking about the fact that humanity has suffered plagues throughout our history. But what an amazing time we're in now because, you know, my home is filled with books and I can 
take a deep dive. Sometimes this current moment is just overwhelming to me. And then I go read about the 16th or 17th century. I can just disappear. And of course, the internet and Netflix and all these other things offer us ways to indulge curiosity. Um, and the last thing I stress is courage and just always acknowledging that this is a very difficult time. And just hanging in there, working from home, staying together is is all about being brave. And so I'm always keeping those those things in front of everyone. I love that uh, connection, curiosity, and courage. And, and, you know, the idea with uncertainty is sometimes you feel like it's all happening to you, right? Um, so is there an opportunity to kind of turn it around and somehow be curious about the uncertainty? You know, oh, I wonder what's going to happen today, <laughs> right? Um, I wonder if... Um, you know, I've, there have been so many things that we just have, I'll speak for myself, you know, been, you know, completely un, um, uh, you know, impossible to imagine from before. So, um, but being curious about it rather than kind of being taken out by it. So instead of being, you know, in the part of the ocean that continues to kind of tip you over, um, looking for it, right? And, um, and I like the idea of, of doing things that are unexpected and, and getting people to sort of embrace the things that are hard. Um, and, and I think that's where courage comes in. So, you know, on a Zoom call, for example, you know, insisting that everyone dresses, right? Um, because that sort of normalcy um, is, is hard, but, but somehow maybe important or getting people to stand up, you know, or, or do a stretch or, um, somehow be kind of grounded in that moment and, and as a reminder that um, we are still physical people and we do still need to be with each other and with objects, um, even though we may not know exactly when that can happen. So I want to uh, just thank you guys all so much for being here today and the stand in for being with you in person is to get to see your faces and to see the art behind you and to um, celebrate the courage that you guys are all um, embodying I think not only for your immediate families but for your staffs and for your communities um, in the broadest possible way and I think what we all need is to be seen and to be heard. And that's what we're seeing and hearing, particularly in this moment in time. And um, I know that museums do matter and I am grateful on behalf of the Meridian Center for Cultural Diplomacy that you guys took the time to um, add your voices to something that I think is essential. Um, museums are essential and culture is essential, and art is essential, and diplomacy is essential. So thank you all so much. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you. Good to see thank everybody. You. Hope we can see each other in person one day. Soon. Yeah, soon. <laughs> okay. Bye. All the best. All the best with your opening. Thank you.